So, the story so far. I am attempting to port the Fusix operating system to the ESP8266. I have the kernel running up to the point where it's actually trying to load a binary. There's a block device on the internal flash and a file system that may or may not work. So the next thing we need to do is to actually load the init binary into memory and then we can get started on the code needed to actually, you know, run it. But before we can do that, we actually need to have a binary to load. So I'm taking some time out of the kernel to instead work on the libc and application side of things because we also need to make that work. Now, it has been a little while since I've looked at this. So I will have to figure out how it all works. Fusix has a uh, its own libc and system call layer, so there is only one thing we need to port. Uh, and then we can go and actually build all the applications and put together a root file system with some stuff in it. So, uh, so what happens when you actually make this? It seems to be done, so... Oh, right. That's just built the cross-platform things. Uh, we are going to have to touch this at some point. The system call library is actually generated from these commands here. Uh, so let's take the... Uh, It's interesting, the Z80-1s aren't there. Well, let's take the 8080. So we have a little program here that reads in all the system calls and then spits out chunks of code that actually make the system call happen. Uh, this, is, this is the easiest way of generating all the system call stubs, which are the little machine code routines that actually call out to the kernel. For the 8080, calling out to the kernel is literally a jump into the kernel, to the syscall entry point. But I think we can do a little bit better than that. So, where does the actual... Well, this is the actual libc. Oh, right, and there are multiple make files for... Uh, for each platform. I can find them. Here they are. So we are going to want what's a decent 32-bit uh, one. So we are going to want to copy this. So you see, this is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, it just builds all the C stuff plus a bit of machine code stuff, including the dreaded set jump and the slightly less dreaded CRT things. All right, so let's copy this. Make file 68000 to make file ESP8266. Now, normally, the user land, which is all the actual user applications that are going to run on top of Fusix, are independent of what kind of platform you're on. So uh, it doesn't care whether you're running on an MSX or an Amstrad PCW or anything like that. They all have a Z80. They all support the same Z80 ABI, so you use the same user land for all these things. That's not the case for us, unfortunately. Because the ESP8266 has no memory manager, we have to bake in uh, the addresses where the executables are going to be loaded into the libc. So our libc is specific to the ESP8266 rather than just being a generic LX106 uh, executable. In fact, uh, in fact, that is not entirely true, that it is possible to generate re relocatable executables, but I'm not going to because that's work. Okay, so... Loading, there we go. Right, so we need to 
tell it how to invoke the cross compiler. And we've already done that. It's in CPU LX106 rules.muck. So we just copy this. Cross compiler is LX106 LPCC. LX106 ELF uh, extensor LX106 ELF as extensor LX106 ELF R platform is the ESP8266. Okay, uh, the compiler flags. Uh, I believe this platform does not have a floating point unit, so that should work. This is 68,000. There's another soft float which we don't really need. Uh, okay, this is this is referencing the libc headers. And I don't know what fixed is, but we'll get rid of it. Now we may need some other things as well. So if you look at the kernel, we are using uh, the long calls flag, which causes all jumps generated by the compiler to be the long form with the full 32-bit range. Uh, this is because the kernel needs to call into the ROM and uh, and to other stuff like the uh, the code we put into the instruction RAM and so on. However, we don't need that. And force L32, which causes the code to always generate 32-bit accesses. This is necessary to allow us to put data in the flash and the instruction RAM. Now, we are not going to be using either of those. Long calls we don't need because we're not calling into anything other than the libc. And force L32 we don't need because we're not going to put any of our data in the instruction RAM. Because we've got 64K of data RAM, but only 31.5K of instruction RAM, it's actually better for us to put data, there's read-only data, uh, into data RAM. Uh, our loader will put it there when the binary loads. So we can do native byte and word accessors and not need this. This will also generate smaller code, which is good, and faster code, which is also good. Okay, so that one is going to be generic. Uh, I think we want drive wire, but we do want user structs. And I suspect that could be all we need. Okay, so let's try building it and see what happens. Uh, okay, able to find a file. Okay, I will actually go up here and set up my usual auto builder. And this is going to be this call big uh, file DSP8266. Uh, this, the enter command is really useful. You feed in a list of files, then enter will run the command in the double quotes whenever one of those files changes. So that's going to fail because we do not have our tools command. Uh, that's actually referencing... something else. Ah, right. You remember I said there was a syscall generator program? This is trying to run it, so we're going to have to actually do that now. So it's going to be uh, tools syscall ESP8266.c anything then oh no that make files in the top level that goes here 
So this is easy enough. Uh, let's put this in roughly alphabetical order. ESP8266. Okay, we will actually go up one. So that we can, when we edit our syscall program, the auto builder will auto build it. Okay, there's nothing there right now. So we are going to copy the 68, I'm in the wrong place. Tools, syscall, ESP8266 to C. Okay. And that is here. We are going to copy the 68,000 one. Uh, and here it is, next to my bit rotted MSP 431, which uh, also works by calling directly to the kernel. All right, so this is going to be, this is just a boilerplate thing. Uh, fork. Fork is special, we don't care about it. Commenting correct. Commenting indentation. Mm. It's wrong, but it's now s sensible. Oh, I can't remember how to make Clang format change the uh, indentation. All right, so now we are going to be using a facility of the LX6, which is the syscall instruction, which is intended for exactly this. Syscall is a special instruction that can be called, which generates a particular kind of exception that the kernel will catch and is used for user programs talking to the kernel. So where is the detailed documentation for it? Here we go. It's just syscall. Uh, no, that's not the right one. This tells you how the instruction works, which is really not very exciting. What I'm looking for is the right system calls. Uh, system call is uh, it's used to talk to the kernel. If you're using the only the only restriction that the LX6 puts on you is that if you're using windowed registers, system call request zero has a special purpose that's generated by the chip itself. Uh, however, we do not have the windowed register ABI. Um, it would be nice if we could use a two for our own purpose. It wants you to put the system call request number into A2. So the thing is, the LX6 passes parameters into a function in registers when you're up to four, I think, four arguments. Is this described? Uh, 
Here we go. This is the ABI. This is how functions call each other. So A2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you have six incoming arguments. So ideally for a system call, all we want is the syscall instruction, nothing else. Uh, that will pass the arguments in registers straight to the kernel so that we can we need one register for this system call number and then up to four parameters we have six registers available uh, we do have to set the system call number you know what I'm just going to follow the ABI here even though it's work We do we have any varag system calls? Varag system calls pass their parameters on the stack. Uh, where does it get the list of system calls from? A header. So here are the system calls. Uh, open is Varag's. I think we just pass those as if they're four. Uh, no, we're going to have to do this properly. I'm going to have to find out how the compiler passes varogs. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, the open system core of opening a file comes in two forms. You've got the two-parameter version and the three-parameter version. And the way this is typically implemented is not described in there is uh, that should be in studlib studio studio not stood I.O. Uni stood? Uni stood. Not uni stood. Yeah, apparently like this. The way this is typically implemented is like this, with a, uh, a var arg specifier. And these get passed specially. So that's actually going to be a bit of research. All right, so what we need to do is in our generated machine code, we align because we need to do that. Our input arguments are passed in A2, 3, 4, and 5. We want to put these into A3, 4, 5, and 6 with the system call number in A2. So let's put the system call number into A2, which is movi A2, comma, D, and this is the system call number. Uh, we can't actually put that here. We have to put this down here after we move all the other arguments. And after that, we call the system call routine. So when we pass in our parameters, <coughs> we need to move them into the right place. 
the number of system calls can be the number of parameters is either is anything from zero to four. So if there is one parameter it's coming in in A2 and we want to put it into A3. Likewise, if there are two parameters, A4, A3, three parameters, A5, A4, and four parameters, A6, A5. Each one of these falls through to the one before. So this move, so if we get four parameters, this moves A5 to A6, A4 to A5, A3 to A4, A2 to A3, puts the system call number in A2 and calls the system call. It might actually be possible, given the way this platform system calls work, to use the same routine for all system calls. No, no, it can't, because we still have to do this. Okay, let's just stick with this. Uh, now, varargs, I'm not sure what to do here. Let's write a test program. So our open is looks like this. It's called T open for a reason. So we're going to call T open like so and like so. And now we're going to compile it into machine code. Make sure it's optimized to make the code easier to read. Oops, I forgot to put a parameter in. Not that it will make any difference. And let's see what that made. Okay, so. Surprising not a code, actually. So here we have the standard entry point. Uh, we allocate a stack frame, and on this platform, stack frames must be a multiple of 16 bytes. We're saving A12, which is one of the callee saves registers, which is defined so... Well, it's one of A8 up, so it is not a incoming register. We right. We get the the pointer to our string into a twelve. Uh, so that's the first parameter. That's interesting. It's going into a twelve. Here is our second parameter, which is a three. We put the string pointer into a two. So now our two parameters are in A2 and A3. That's not really good code. We then save the link register. Uh, this is the return address onto the stack. This norm would normally go up here in the function prolog, but for some reason the compiler is not doing that. So that is passing the two parameters in A2 and A3 as expected. Right, now for the three parameter version. This is just what I want to see. It's putting our three parameters into three registers, even though it's a varargs calling convention routine. Good. This means that for varargs, we just pretend it's a for argument uh, subroutine. That seems 68k specific. And the indentation's gone wrong, so let's just run that again. 
Mm. That's better. Okay, so that is the entry to the system call. That's taking our parameters and calling the kernel with them. On exit, we want to check to see whether the system call succeeded or not. Uh, I do not believe... Right. We don't need this. This has got to do with the 68k having pushed parameters onto the stack. On exit from a system call, the kernel will typically return two values, uh, a single flag to say whether it succeeded or not, and the return value. However, the C functions that represent the system calls, such as open here, will typically return a non-negative number, meaning it succeeded, or minus one, meaning it fails. And if it fails, then the error code is put into the erno variable. So what we're doing here is this is checking to see, yeah. Uh, right. What this is, on the 68,000, the return value is in D0, which is the right place to, uh, for a return parameter from the system call function. The error of code goes in D1. Ah, that's not quite what I expected. What this is doing is the actual Erno itself is going in D1. If it's not zero, then we consider there to be an error. So we store the error code in Erno and return. That's actually easier to work with. So the logic we want here is if the error code is not zero, something like that, where result for us is going to be an A2 and the error code is going to be an A3. So how do we do this on this platform? Well, the I could probably puzzle it out, but it's much, much easier to do this. If a3 is not equal to 0, no equals a3, return a2. And now we compile it. And what do we have? Wow, that's small. So, we test a3 we are ah. if a3 is 0 branch forwards to the case where there is no error there is now an error so we want to put the value in a3 into erno to do that, we put the address of Erno into A4. And store A3 into it. Remember from several sessions ago, if you do mov i with a address, it will turn it into an L32R and put uh, the value here in to a constant pool. Where is the constant pool? Here it is. And it'll do that for us automatically, which is nice. So that's all we need to do to store the value in Erno. Uh, we're now just going to return the normal error code, which is an A2. So there is the end of our error case. And just do a ret. And the 
kernel will have made sure that A0, which is the link register, has not been modified. Okay, so that should be our system call, our user space system call code. I'm sure there will be something wrong with it. Uh, this writes out the the make file to generate the system calls uh, this is of course it's going to be uh, extensor lx106 elf g uh, elf as and we don't actually need to set anything else because it's not used anywhere. So all the assembler sources, this is boilerplate, good. Right, I think that's us done for that. So what happens when we save? built our uh, hang on we we didn't add it here esp68 well it says it built it so There it is. Uh, tools, syscall, ESP8266. It's trying to write out the make file. Okay, that's a slightly better error message. Ah, we did not create the the directory to put all our assembler files in. So let's see what this does. Okay. It has if we look here, it's generated all the system call stubs. But they're not assembling, so let's have a look why. Exit.s, line 9. <laughs> I'm too used to the 6502, and I uh, instinctively put a hash sign there. Fantastic. So it assembled all the system call stubs and it turns out that we do need that uh, it's now trying to what am I doing this one so the reason why it's produced the error message rc no such file or directory this is because it's just tried to call the r archiver command which i yeah which i decided wasn't being used so didn't define so that's expanded to an empty string so the rc is the first argument passed into the archiver that's just one of those things you recognize once you've been working with make files for a while I hate make files. Okay, it rebuilds them, it archives them, and I didn't put the new line in. Okay, it's It's assembled them, 
but I think it's put them put all the output files in the wrong place so the archiver can't find them wonder where they went that is completely not how to work the find command I want to do that uh, maybe they just didn't go anywhere. Okay, well, now to fix that, the GNU as command takes, I believe it's minus O for the output file. Yep. Minus C is supposed to put it in the correct place, but anyway, let's do that. Okay. Right, so it's now generated all of our system calls into a library, which has gone into syslib.lib. Which is this, and we can use ARL. Apparently, we need to use the right one. ARL, AR. What are the commands? T, ART, to list the contents. So here are all the .o files. A AR compiler library is actually a file archive for deep historical reasons to do with the origins of Unix. Okay, uh, right, now we need to do set jump. So the thing about set jump is it's very, very compiler specific and I have a feeling that I've got one already that I can just borrow slash steal. So this is a third party mini lib C. So I can fetch the source for it. So here is the register window mechanism, but we're not using that. We're using the call zero ABI. So this is the windowed version. Uh, wow, there's a lot of this. Here is the call zero version, which is pretty normal. Yeah, that's uh, straightforward. So I should be able to basically copy those. Uh, so and there ought to be a long jump as well. So what set jump does is it sets the execution state, it's the state of all the registers which need to be saved, uh, and the stack pointer, which so that it can be restored later. It's used for making non-local calls around a program. Uh, I did refresh that, didn't I? Did I create the file? Apparently I didn't create the file. So I 
Which is this is generic. Oh, okay, soft float doesn't work. Uh, now is there a long jump? Yes, there is, in a separate file. Yeah, okay. So let's create that as well. And we'll also probably need to create our own header file for it. in this because the actual layout it depends radically on platform all right so let's take a look at this implementation there's actually nothing particularly exotic here which is nice luck it's really good that this system isn't using windowed registers because uh, that makes life so much more complicated. Uh. Okay. So how is this going to work? Set jump saves the state onto the in, uh, into uh, a structure. Oh great! Now we've got two of them. Uh, okay. Anyway, text align for global set jump. Uh, set jump. So. Uh, the first parameter to set jump is the structure pointer that we're writing it to. So this just stores, you know, all the stuff. Uh, I can actually just copy, copy that. It's so trivial that uh, it's not copyrightable. Uh, this is the stack pointer. Do we get to use LR? Uh, apparently we don't. LP. Right, this doesn't mention a particular register name, so let's just go with A0. Okay, so that works. Now we do need to look at this to see how many slots there are, which is six. So that we go over here, and we need to define this accordingly. Uh, and we are actually going to leave that for now, because it does actually properly produce an error. So I'm just going to wait until we see that error and then implement it, because that way it will be easier to test. Okay, so we want to get rid of that other file we put in by mistake. Set jump lx106.s. Uh, I want to fix this. No soft float option. Oh, and now it's building huge, great sways of the libc. And it fails because we haven't implemented the CRT. Uh, I do want to implement set, uh, long jump, which is 
It's the counterpart to set jump. It restores the state Oops, text. and it works exactly the same way but in reverse. So what the user sees is that they call They call set jump and pass in a structure. The state of the system is stored into that structure. Then at some later date, somebody will call long jump, at which point the the, uh, the execution point will jump back to, into set jump. So set jump will return again. Uh, the caller can tell the difference by the parameter. The first time set jump is called, when it saves the state, it returns zero. And you can see that happening here. Uh, when long jump is called, you pass in a value, which is the new return value to set jump. So uh, we load all these things. We restore the stack. The stack pointer is guaranteed to go backwards when this happens. It can never go forwards. Well, it won't work if you make it go forwards. Uh, there is one weird gotcha, which is that if you pass in a zero to long jump as the parameter, uh, because zero is used to indicate that set jump has returned for the first time, this is illegal, so it turns into a one. And here we have some code that does it. Uh, we load, that's quite cunning. So on entry, A3 contains the, uh, well, A3 contains the value. So we load one into A2, which is the return value which is the backup return value. And if a, hang on, a move into a2. Oh, that's a rather, that's a neat instruction. So move a3 into a2 if a3 is not equal to zero. Let me double check that. Is that I think this search isn't working right or maybe I should be pressing the right button right move nez uh, this is the floating point version but it will have the same logic uh, not quite the same logic we find the real one Move if not equal to zero. Yeah, if the contents of AT is non-zero, copy AS to AR. That's neat, I like that. Anyway, that should now work. That didn't build anything, which suggests that I need to add a thing to here. Yes, I do long jump lx106.s okay and now we need to do the CRT the CRT is the C runtime it uh, it contains the code that gets executed when the binary starts the kernel will load the binary into memory and it will jump to the entry point and it will arrive here so this will need to do basic initialization, uh, initialize stud.io, 
uh, set up argc and argv, etc., and the environment pointer, and eventually call the real main function. It's the CRT that's responsible for the argc and argv parameters arriving in a C main function. Uh, ESP266. Actually, this is generic. So this should actually build now. No, it doesn't. Uh, where's you've got CRT S, and we don't have a NOSTED IO version. The NOSTED IO version produces smaller binaries. We're not going to worry about that for the time being. Okay. Right, we now have a libc. It's missing the CRT stuff, so we'll not actually be able to compile anything with it. But uh, there's our, oh, we have a maths library too. There's our math library, there's our term cap library. Here we go. Cursors, maths library, read line, system call library, term cap. Has it built the libc? It might not have. Interesting. Anyway, let's actually write it. We know how the calling convention works, so we're actually just going to copy this with a few wrinkles. Uh, section header here puts this function into its own special section so the linker can put it in the right place. This is the I believe this is the new lightweight Fuzix system call format. No it is not. This is the new lightweight system call format, which is the one we're going to be using. The MSP430 version, which I was looking at, is obsolete. So let's do that instead. So, uh, magic number to say it's a Fusix executable. This is the CPU identifier. Is that being used by anybody? Um, this is the the code that actually loads the binary. Okay, we've this is the bit where we read we're parsing the header. Uh, setting up arguments. Okay, here's the header. Header okay validates the header. Okay, we do need to set the system call library correctly. Sysip ah, right, that explains what the... If you remember the other day, there was this, uh, sys, this set syscpu uh, kernel function that I was wondering what it was. That returns the CPU number, the CPU ID. So I bet that somewhere in here
here it is exec.h this is where our list of CPUs is defined so we are just going to put one down the bottom So, uh, this we don't care about. Uh, actually, let's do this differently. We're going to declare ourselves as being an LX106, as the CPU type, with the sub type being ESP8266. This way we only use up one of these IDs. And we now need to go to here. Tricks, yes, no. I think it was actually in here. Yeah. So this is going to be ID 11. Sys CPU feet needs to be def uh, defined in the in here somewhere. Right. So where did we put our CRT? Uh, we're actually going to need to edit our make file again. Do we? 's all right ah okay uh, the difference between lowercase s and uppercase s is that uppercase s assembly files get pushed through the C++ processor before assembly which is kind of useful And in fact, we're going to have to move this because our our CRT zero is specific to a particular platform type. And apparently I already ah because I I messed up the make file uh, it wrote that so let's put that in here uh, add CRT zero is P two six six forget CRT zero LX one zero six remove the actual file. Go to the make file platform. Yeah, okay. Right, now we can actually start writing our code. Uh, CPU type is LX106. Uh, feature set is this is the ESP8266 module. This is the base address, the place where the 
binary is loaded, which mean, which is meaningless for us, so we just leave it. Uh, bin man. Hmm, I thought the linker made these. Okay, well, let's leave these in. Uh, this is the offset of the start address, which is that. Uh, this is the size of zero page, which is meaningless for us. Here we have the address of the signal handler. When signals are delivered to the program, it will the kernel will force a call to here. And then we actually do our code. Uh, let's do... No, yeah, I was right the first time. Let's do it like this. I don't believe those exclamation marks will be honored correctly. Anyway, let's get rid of the old header. Comment this out. The environment pointer is four bytes. Unknown pseudo op data two. Is it called something else on this platform? Word apparently. And I bet that data one is going to be byte. And of course, I forgot that a, a semicolon is uh, not the comment character. Uh, data one is probably. Byte exclamation mark is not a comment character. Uh, cannot resolve. Oh, okay. We have a CRT header. No actual code, but so we go back to our test program. Right because this bit's a little bit subtle. Uh, we need to wipe the BSS. This is the portion of the data which is guaranteed by the C standard to be initialized to zero. And the way this typically works is it's something like this. Just a simple loop. Uh, we are doing it four bytes at a time. So what can our uh, this compiler turn this into? A fairly small amount. So mov i into a2 becomes bss Start A3 becomes BSS end. Uh, 
Did I write that code correctly? This is interesting. There's, I don't see an add. I don't see it incrementing the pointer. Unless mov.n is doing it. But doesn't that just copy registers? Could be start at BSS start. Keep going while the pointer is less than the end and advance the pointer. Ah. Yep. So what was happening is the compiler had noticed that I was setting pointer to, to zero rather than the thing being pointed at to zero. Therefore, this addition it was adding a value to something it knew was always going to be zero, therefore it was always setting it to four. Sometimes compilers are smarter than they really, really... It's turned the thing into a call to memset. That's not what I wanted. I actually wanted to do the code of the that I told it to do. Does this work? No. See, the reason why I don't want it to, I don't want to call memset is, well, I could make it call memset, but honestly, this setup code, there's quite a lot of it, and I just don't care. Uh, like, we don't need to set up stack frame because there isn't one in this routine. There will be a way to stop it from calling uh, built-ins. But it would be far too useful for GCC to actually list all the command line options on the in the man page or in the help. Uh, now, of course, we don't have a man page for these. That would be useful. Okay, I'm going to have to do this myself then. So... So let's look at what this actually made. That's not useful. Hang on, I can I can nerf the mem set by doing that. Although I can nerf the mem set optimization by doing that. That's better. Okay. So A2 is our running pointer, A3 is the boundary at the end, A4 is a hand of zero which we're going to be using to actually write the thing. So uh, BSS might be empty, so let's do the conditional first. 
if our running pointer is greater than or zero the end, jump to the end. Otherwise, write our zero to the running pointer location and increment the running pointer by four bytes and loop. Right. So our BSS should be ready. The next thing we want to do is to initialize stud.io, which is just a simple, like so. Now, argc and argv are on the stack. So we must have, a, we, there will be something on the stack. There will, there will be valid data there. The MSP430 has push and pop instructions. The way this one works is that argc and argv are, are values on the stack. And once they've been removed, what's left is the environment structure. And then above the environment structure will be argv itself. Now we don't have push and pop. So what we're going to do instead is uh, we want to load Uh, just wondering what order they are in. Okay, R right, R12 must be argc. So that'll be R2, stack frame offset zero, R3, S4. So that is argc, that is argv. Therefore, R4, which is going to be our environment pointer, is the word above that. Uh, is that? I think that's valid. The 16-bit alignment requirement is going to be a bit irritating. Okay, so we actually want to store this, so S32I R4 R50. So that pushes that we're going to keep argc and argv in the first two parameter registers for calling main and uh, we're going to write the environment pointer into a global variable for access. It also gets passed in to main as the third parameter that no one ever uses. All right. And we set the return address to be the exit function and call main and that should be our C runtime and registers start with an A and bad register name right that's not call x0 that is call 0 uh, that's also an A, uh, unknown opcode or form call, that should be a hash. Okay, we, now we've got our C runtime. Good. 
so let's uh, commit this. Are there any files that we need to add? Don't see anything offhand. Right, the next stage is we wish to build our applications, which live in applications. And let me just actually restart this. That, uh, that will change the root directory of the tree viewer. There's a key to do it. I can't remember what it is. So we're not going to build everything right just yet. We want init, so we're going to have to build the util block. Util contains the base Unix utilities, and the one we care about is init here, which is surprisingly complex. So we need a make file. So let's copy the good old 68,000. 266 and this should all look very familiar No soft float, no sixty eight thousand. Uh, and I think we do want that. What is actually in these things? Oh, right, it's stuff that I'm actually going to have to implement. Uh, when linking stuff, we do need the C library. We want libgcc. And this is the linker script that will actually generate the executables we want. And we can't use the standard way of doing it because we need because of our weird memory architecture. And this is going to have to be different. Um, let's just change that to false for now. That will cause uh, assembly to fail. Okay, so what happens if we actually try to build this? Okay, that looks sensible. So it it compiled the C file with no warnings. It then failed because it couldn't find the linker script. Sorry, got called away. So I'm trying to remember where I was. Yes, I was about to start work on the linker script. So normal where am I going? Normal uh, platforms, that is the traditional Unix style, 
as binaries that put the various segments all in order in a single address space. So this is the original, actually I will LF2SP866 LD. So uh, So this is putting uh, all the yeah this this is this is compiler nonsense we don't really care about we have actually this looks kind of odd to me actually yeah we have a text section which appears first in the binary this contains all the code. Uh, it also contains the read-only data. Then we have the data segment, which appears after it. This is read from the binary into memory to initialize all the variables assigned to the data segment. Then after that, we have the BSS segment, which contains zero initialized variables. This does not get loaded in the binary at all because the values are all zero. Uh, after that is the heap. I also see a stack there, yes. This is a surprisingly complicated linker script given how simple everything is. All right, let's uh, do our version of this. So we've got two address spaces. We've got data and code. So our data lives D. Our data lives here. So that's three F F E eight O O O and it is sixteen K long. And we have a code memory which lives here. And that is at this address, and it is 31 and a half K long. So this should actually be fairly straightforward. The text segment goes into code. Uh, this looks like an arm thing that we don't want. Uh, this is all that's going to go into the code. I'm not sure what this is for. Let's get rid of this address. This appears at the very beginning so that we don't need the uh, the alignment. Uh, we do uh, this looks where is the actual code appearing? Oh here, here it is. And you know what, I'm going to chop out all this stuff. This is mostly used by C++, which frankly I don't really care about. So we're going to, going to go with the simple version for brevity. We have no EXIDX. Okay, we've got the data segment. The data segment also does not need to be aligned because it's appearing at the beginning of this section. Uh, our system doesn't have got. Yeah, we don't want any of this stuff. All right, data. Firstly, let's put all the read-only data into the data segment. Then we put the read-write data into the data segment. Uh, that is a microblaze thing. We don't care about any of this. 
Um, let's see what is this actually used anywhere? No. Let's use this. Uh, C plus plus constructors. No idea. No idea. Oh, initializer and finalizer. Yeah, let's lose all that. And this goes into the data segment and p header. An exception table stuff. Don't care. Right, the BSS. This is the uninitialized data. So align BSS start. Uh, okay, that looks correct. And this also goes into the data segment, I think. Uh, there should be a way to prevent that from actually being emitted. I think I need Uh, a no load. There we go. BSS. Yeah, let's get rid of the explicit aligns. That's a line for no load. Following this is the heap, which occupies the remainder of the space. Uh, though we do actually want to stack. Um, um. Although now I think of it, I've forgotten about the U data block. The U data block now lives in kernel memory, so it doesn't appear in the data memory entirely. So let's get rid of that lot of junk. Let's leave the debug stuff because this won't actually go into the final executable, but it will exist in the ELF file. Uh, the stack, the user stack used by the process, we actually want to put that Uh, where do you want to put it? Normally the stack goes at the very top of memory. But I think I will actually put it... Uh, in the BSS area. Um, not quite in the BSS area. Let me just quickly go look and see how the... Uh, the malloc routine f figures out the top of the heap. Uh, malloc is subtle and annoying. So... Right, it calls sbrook. Okay, let's put the stack right here. It needs to be 16 mice aligned, not loaded, and we want to. F uh, we want it to be. Let's make it 1k. That's going to be too much, but it should do. Uh, hmm. Where does the Where does the uh, where is the stack pointer initialized? Probably the top of RAM. Uh, 
let's okay so each process needs to have its own user stack and uh, this gets set up by the kernel and I'm just trying to remember where it gets set Ah, place arguments, environment, and stack at the top of user space memory. Okay, so we do not need a stack block. We're always going to put it at the top of memory. Okay, so let's try that make again, see what happens. Syntax error. The LD script syntax sometimes requires semicolons and sometimes it requires the absence of a semicolon. Uh, literal placed after use in header. Okay. Oh, that's awkward. Right, the L32R instruction, which we are using in many places, but in this particular version, in this particular situation, we are using it in the uh, in the header block. These turn into L32Rs. Uh, it loads a 32-bit constant out of a constant pool into a register. The L32R instruction takes a uh, the number of bytes to subtract from the program counter. This means that the constant pool, or the literal pool in their term, has to appear before the use. Now we the header block has to be first because it's you know the header block but the header blocks literals have to go before it and there isn't anywhere to put it so we are going to have to change this code And let's also fix the and let's just line these things up. Where is the tab stop? Yep. Now the Now the problem here, well, what we could do is to simply have something like this. So this starts a new section. This is normal code. It can appear anywhere in the image. Uh, this is the header block and has to be first. The problem is that this is not an address. This is a offset, which can only be 256 bytes long. So, uh, one thing we could do is simply have this, or we can 
put this and its literal block in its own section and make sure those appear after the header, thus making sure that the entry point is within range. But I think for simplicity we'll do this. Uh, so it's global. Actually, you don't want that to be a global. Uh, 62 junk at end of line. Okay, now what does this do? Uh, text is not within region code. Yes, it is. Oh, address is not within region code. Uh, also, I've remembered that I need to... There is something else I need to do, and I should do this to the kernel as well. Retail make file ESP 266, which is we want another couple of compiler flags, which is function sections, data sections. What this does is it forces each function to appear in its own section and each variable to appear in its own section, thus allowing the linker to do a much better job of optimizing things. Uh, clean, make. That wasn't quite what I was expecting. Yeah, we need to do that with the library as well. We should be able to do this. Hmm. Intriguing. Because one of the side effects is that the section names get uh, suffixed with the uh, section with the functional data variable name. That makes it much easier to figure out what these are referring to. Okay, BSS end. Uh, we just haven't set this. BSS end equals dot. Uh, undefined reference to seek handler. Uh, that's the s signal handler. I'm not sure. Is it actually defined somewhere? Oh, it needs to be in the... Where is that defined? Right, that's new since the MSP430. Uh, let's take a look at the 68,000. Uh, no. Let's take a look at the 8080. Right, here is the signal handler. I have to write it myself. Called to indirect signals from the kernel through code which saves the non reentrant OS glue. Uh, this needs to save everything onto the stack. Yeah, let's just dub that out.
uh, that's a that's a special instruction that goes to the, uh, the the debugger if there is one, which there isn't, so it will cause a fatal exception. Okay. Right. Uh, this is. Hmm. These need to reference the kernel, not the kernel. These need to reference the ROM because that's where these live. Now we could simply do provide lines like we did for the kernel. Uh, yeah, here. I do not believe there will be in range for the linker uh, for a standard call so yeah that's not going to work so what instead we're going to have to do is uh, text global uudiv si3 actually that ain't going to work Let me just. Uh, the, it might work. Jump has a longer range than call. So. More. No, oh, hang on. That's the wrong address. E268. Mod SI3. Div SI3. Uh, alignment, alignment. Uh, dangerous relocation cannot encode. Yeah, I think that's still out of range. Okay, we're going to have to do it the hard way. And we need a temporary register to put this in. I don't believe A6 will be in use, so I think we should just be able to do this. Okay. I mean, it might not work, but but now we still need to figure out what's going on here. Can we get more information? Can we get a map? wasn't really what I was expecting. Okay, so A for A is the end of mem copy. Huh? Well, here you can see the sections that each function goes into. So A for A is... Wait a minute. These are code addresses. 
These are data addresses. These should be I think these are all just wrong. See, these are not the these are not the right addresses for but it does know where the sections live because it's displaying them here. Where's that linker script gone? So text goes to the code section. This goes to the data section, data section, junk. These must be prior to relocation. It doesn't make any sense otherwise. Um, I have told them it's supposed to be in the right section. So what's one of the other addresses? Uh, one F six zero. One F six zero. BSS, not within section data. So I can see all the variables are here. So what is going on? I'm going to go away, go away and do a little bit of research. Okay, well, I have made it work. Uh, the trick is to tell it that the text section starts at the origin of the code memory area and the data section starts at the origin of the data memory area. But I do not recall having to do this in the past, so either I'm misremembering it, this isn't how it actually works at all, or something else is going on. But I can now see in the map file, uh, here we have the addresses of the various things. The header is at 401, wait a minute. Ooh, ooh that's nasty, okay. So the header needs to appear at the beginning of the file, but it does not actually contain anything that's used at runtime. So it doesn't need to be loaded. I think it is loaded, just because it's easier that way. Um, So let's take a look at that 8080 version again. Okay, so the header does appear at the beginning of the text segment. Right, this, okay, this means that my header needs to appear at the beginning of the text segment, so it appears at the beginning of the file, even though it's not used at runtime, and we could actually just not load it. But anyway, that should, work. Uh, so here is our BSS. 
this is not a big program. Uh, here is our data, which is immediately preceding it. Here's the beginning of the data at the beginning of our data memory area. And here's the end of our code. Uh, I will actually put a text in equals dot. So, yep. Okay. I think that's working. Let's just try running the make file and seeing what happens. Right, uh, I disabled flat to map. So I've been thinking about how this works, so let's just put it back and see what happens. We can look at the binaries. I think what it does is it just pulls the appropriate P headers out, the program headers, uh, and assembles the binary and then patches the header. Uh, That's the wrong make file. I want this one. And I want elf2. Oh, these are commoned out. That's nice. Okay. Rules.esp8266. add. So I believe this is all common. Let's just take a look at the 8080 version, which seems to be pretty modern. Seems to be missing quite a bit of stuff. Ah, this, this is a Amsterdam compiler kit version. Uh, platform it doesn't use the G, it doesn't use GCC that's also different okay uh, let's take a look at the 68,001 elf to fusix is elf to flut so elf to flut minus s I think that's the stack size Let's make a small stack. Okay, so here we replace all this with include physics root applications rule slash ESP8 rules dot ESP8266. Okay, now let's run the make file and see what happens. Hmm. I think we haven't set Fusix root. Let's do this instead so we don't need to. Really? Rules with an S. I've had dinner and I've got my tea. Why am I making these mistakes? Okay. Elf to flut. Where is elf to flut? Apparently it's nowhere. Is this a standard tool? No. Okay. Uh, I saw a reference to another thing called binman. So what does this do? Uh, user space binaries doesn't have the common packing magic.
Yeah, I don't like any of that. Okay, we're going to have to do this the hard way. So, instead of calling elf to flut, we are going to do uh, obj copy. The output target is binary. I think that will do input and output. Um, I've missed something. really not support the standard minus a minus small o for the output file apparently it doesn't okay so where is elf to physics used okay right we can change this so we want All right, that built and linked a thing. So we now have a binary called banner. Uh, this doesn't look anything like right. 12 megabytes, uh, sorry, 1.2 megabytes. Yeah, that hasn't done what I wanted. So what I was wanting to do is to convert, is to tell it to convert the ELF file to a binary file by simply concatenating the uh, the various p headers. But what it actually seems to have done. These are strings. These are the. St oh, this is the data. Ah, I think it's actually done more or less the right thing. So the data segment appears first in the in in memory order. So obj copy has put that first in the file. The code appears one megabyte further on. No, it doesn't. The code appears a slightly different. Oh, wait, hang on, we don't need to. We've got our LD file here. Uh, the code appears a one megabyte plus 16K further on. No, apparently that's wrong too. But the code is in here somewhere. It's here <laughs> at the end of the file. Uh, and here is our header. So we actually want a slightly cleverer. All we need to do is to take the text segment and the data segment and concatenate them. That should work. I wonder, can it, can I make obj copy do that? Okay, more reading time. So when in doubt, write it yourself. Here is my version of elf to flat as a very small shell script. 
what it does is it uses obj copy to pull out the text segment uh, obj copy again to pull out the data segment and then it concatenates them together so uh, I just need one more tweak because I need to tell it what tool chain to use and let's clean and rebuild and see if it works. Okay, well we have an obvious compiler compilation failure there, but it has actually built several things. So if we take a look at our banner executable, this is the thing that our platform should actually run. We can see here at the top is our header uh, I don't think it knows how long a word is. Let's try a short instead. Let's see if that works better. And that one actually turns out to be correctish. Okay, clean build. Okay, that's better. So here is our magic number. Here is the LX106 CPU identifier and the ESP8266 feature. Base page, byte, hint, byte, code address, a code size, data size, BSS size, offset to the entry point, size hint, stack hint, zero page hint, address of the signal handler, yeah, uh, looking at this and thinking about it, I'm wondering if this is in fact the wrong binary format for the platform because these pointers are actually two bytes long in the standard header. You know what? I We're going to have to write our own loader anyway, so I'm just not going to worry about it. This is going to be a different format. So what does the 32-bit loader do? Right, you see Linux bin flat. Yeah, that's what the... So the elf to flat program that we don't have is actually uh, from the UC Linux uh, code base. And that turns it into a UC Linux format executable. Right. So that actually means that we need to rename this. Uh, and change our rules. And we can keep that. Okay, you're going to make, yeah, those are words. Now, there are, uh, we're not using bin man anymore, which means that we can't rely on bin man to initialize these. So we're actually going to have to do this ourselves. So that is going to be Uh, we need to fill out the header with the size of the various sections. I just start data end. And BSS start and BSS end. So, in our CRT, 
code size is text end minus text start. And I really hope that the linker understands how to do this. Data end minus data start. BSS end minus BSS start. Right. Fantastic. Um, can I do this? Great. Okay, so some tool chains are capable of representing pointer differences like this in the relocatable uh, object file format, which means that this will actually get resolved by the linker and turned into a simple value. But it looks like we can't do this in this situation. So we are going to have to do something else, such as moving all of this into uh, the into the linker, which does know this information. So our header segment now just contains a jump instruction. This will be the first probably three bytes in the executable. It will then be followed by the literals for our entry routine here, and then the entry routine. OK. And now in our linker, in our linker script here, here we're going to manually emit all the various bytes that we need to generate the header. And I will need to go look up what the various commands are. Okay, that's not complicated. Byte short, long, and quad. So the first thing that appears is and I can't actually remember what the comment character is. C style. It's ex executable followed by a byte, which is 11. CPU followed by a one, which is one, two, six, six, followed by a zero, followed by another zero. All right, followed by word correct? No, it should be long. There we go. Okay. Followed by the Entry point routine no size hint, no stack hint. No zero page hint, followed by a 
pointer referring to the signal handler. Now I'm not quite sure whether text start should be here, meaning that the value in this is just the amount of code here to load and not including the header, or whether text start should be here, meaning that that does include the header. I'll do it like this to start with. So, and a fine symbol entry. Uh, dot global entry and our signal handler is also global. Okay. All right, that actually seems to be behaving itself. Let's take a look at the binary. So we have, where did I put it here? So we have the magic number, CPU and feature, base page and hints, length of the text section, which in this case is 09 FO because this is Little Endian, length of the data section, 1514, this, these two bytes and these two bytes, is the length of the BSS. 84 is the entry point. That seems like a large number to me. No, it's right. It's here. You can see that that is... These are addresses in the literal table, and this is code. Uh, zero, 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 and 401000AD is the address of the signal handler. I would be slightly happier if that were aligned. Yeah, I'm... Hmm... These are going to turn back into shorts. So that's back the way the... Yeah, here we go. 090E, 1415, 5CO3. Uh, as we have 64K of data and 31.5K of code, then shorts will fit those, and this actually makes the... Uh, the header the same as it is in the other systems that use this format. I think I got away with that sentence. Right, and that makes the signal handler pointer word aligned. Good. Okay, so what is the problem here? We have div di and div si. Well, we're going to have to put more of these in. You know what? I am going to try and remember how to do macros. Backslash one, dollar one. Try backslash one. Nine four, backslash one. A six, backslash two. Gx A six. Helper U div S I three four O O O E two one C. Helper U mod SI3 OX400 E268. Does that build? No. Too many positional arguments. Uh, 
name comma address backslash n Did that do the right thing? Yes! I actually remembered how that worked. Right. So we need helpers for div di3. Uh, oh, I thought I had still had the boot ROM disassembly. I know where it lives. Div di3. And div si3, uh, div si3, okay, so build that, build that, you mod si3, well, Umod SI3. Uh, Umul S. Mul SIDI3. Umul SIDI3. Mul SIDI3. Putting these help, uh, calling the ROM version of these is a really good idea. Ooh, that actually got somewhere. Right. Uh, because having the, using the version in the ROM means we're not using up any of our vital code space with them, which is extremely nice. Okay. Uh, remember I said that we needed to define that header? Library include set jump. Now... We need to we need to know what the compiler definition is for the for this platform. Is it LX one oh six? No, it is not. How can we find out what it is? I think do we see anything? This shows the commands given to the underlying compiler. That's not necessarily useful. Yeah. Uh if you run this, more binders Vs, does that help? Not really. There may be a Maybe something in here that might be of use, but I suspect probably not. Yeah, I think Yeah, I'm actually going to have to go away and research what this thing is. Uh, it may or may not be in the documentation. Probably won't be here, no. Uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Dump machine. Not useful. 
dump specs. Right, that looks more useful. Stick that into less. Just minus D. No, no, no. Define. No. Okay, CPP options. Nothing there. Debug options. CC1 options. This is kind of where I would expect to find this sort of thing, but it is not that I can see. Okay, I'm going to go away and look this up. Okay, I found out how to do it, which is you invoke the minus DM minus E options and give it an empty file. And this produces 263 different hash defines. And if we look around, we can see here are some extensor definitions. So the one we probably want is not extensor because that's the generic one. What we want is this one, because the if we are using the windowed ABI, we do not want to use this particular set jump definition. So our jump buff is going to be, I believe it was six. Not one, two, three, four, five, yep, six. Yep, <laughs> just checking. Uh, so jump buff end attribute blah, blah, blah. No. like this. Okay, so now let's try running that make file again, if I can find it. Okay, we've got some more missing helpers. UDIV-DI3. UDIV-DI3 is here. Mul di3, mul di3 is here. In fact, there's a bunch of moderately useful looking libc things that we could use. We'd have to disable the uh, the Fusix libc ones. We would also kind of have to hope that any storage they used was compatible. For example, SRAND here is clearly storing the, this is the seeds, the random number generator, is clearly storing that seed at this address. So uh, we would have to make sure to initialize it on process startup and save it on context switches. Yeah, not going to do that. Uh, four, six, yep. U mod di3 U mod di3 you know to sort that Woohoo, that's actually got quite a long way. Uh, undefined reference to htons, or rather h2ns, host to network order. Yes. Right, this appears to be a
Yeah, this is nearly always done in machine code, only compiled and generated for little Indian pro platforms. Um, I th can't remember if the LX6 has Indian swapping. Swap. Yeah, what was that? Byte swap. Uh, no, this is not what we want. Let's try Indian. Oh, there's a big Indian version of the uh, of the platform. Okay. Um, there's clearly not one, so let's just add the C version to our list to ns to see. So build that. That's the wrong list. Well, this one is much messier one. Okay. H two N L will be the same. Okay, right, this is now trying to do the no stud.io version. This is for programs that don't use stud.io. The problem is, so in our CRT here, we actually have a reference to the stud.io library. So just having this present will mean it'll always get initialized, which means it'll always have to be linked in, even if you're not using it. So the way Fusix does this is you, you can have two different CRTs, one which sets this and one which doesn't. Uh, so one which calls this and one which doesn't. So if you don't want stood IO, you use the one that doesn't call it and get smaller binaries. Okay, that's worth doing. And I will actually, this could all be factored out. Uh, we could refactor some of this as well, but honestly, it's not worth it. Okay. So we're going to turn this into, do we actually have, okay, that's just for system calls. So we're going to do that. This is going to contain this stuff, including the signal handler. Okay, so the CRT no longer needs anything from here down. We then copy this to nose.io esb8266.s. We edit the this is a CRT zero no stud IO that's form dot s uh, where are we gonna put our helpers in? Oh uh, we own this file. I kept thinking this was a common one. So since as is gonna be helpers p8266.s, okay, let's 
edit the edit this to take out stud.io all right build this sig handler referenced an expression This kind of suggests that our helper here has been assembled. Is it then included in the, yeah? Yeah, here it is in the helpers. I might don't think it's that, but let's just yeah, okay. Undefined symbol sig handler. Right, that's probably because symbols referenced in the linker in the linker script don't cause things to be pulled in. And it just so happens that this may not be calling anything from our helpers file. So let's just take that out and put it right back in here and here. We'll have to deal with that properly at some point when we actually implement signal handling. I'm not sure signal handling. Did I just add that twice to the same file? Yeah, apparently I did. I'm not sure Fusix actually supports signal handling yet. I have a vague memory it's been worked on. I could be wrong. Okay, we build, 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 more build. Done. Fantastic. Right, so these are all executables which we could theoretically run on our platform. How big is our init? Mm. Well, let's find something small. Decomp, I think it was. This is a decompressor utility. Uh, looks like a binary. Do we have, yes, we've got true. True is incredibly simple. Uh, all this does is return a successful error code. I wonder what's actually in that. Yeah, that's about as simple as you can possibly get. Uh, it won't have the libc in it. So what we've got is the CRT code, uh, some literals, the actual main function itself, exit, underscore, underscore, exit, a system call routine. But yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, 186 bytes, which is not too bad. Uh, we've got Fusuk, the file system checker, which is pretty big, but it's still occupying less than half of our available code space. Quite a lot less, I, I suspect. Uh, I can figure that out. Bin. Here we go. 9k of code, 2k of data, uh, bit under 2k of BSS. Uh, this is a nice one. I wrote that. It's a fourth interpreter. Uh, so seven K code, ten K of data because it's got the fourth dictionary in it. Uh, I'm quite proud of that. It's a entertainingly insane fourth interpreter. Uh, it's you notice this thing at the top here and all these hashes. This is a C file, which is also a shell script. 
you can run it as either and it's also an orc script which is embedded inside and it's also if I scroll down not quite that far but oh wait it is further down than that it's been a while since I looked at this but it's also a fourth compiler when you run it as a shell script it uses the org script to read the source code find these comments compile each of these fourth words into bytecode and embed the bytecode into the script and into the source file so that when you then compile it as a C file you get all your pre-compiled fourth words and the big length list which is here which makes up the dictionary. Quite pleased by that. Anyway, I'm done for tonight. Next time I will actually be trying to load a binary into uh, memory and see if we can make it do anything at all when we run it. Uh, we'll have to add a system call handler. Uh, we'll probably end up with, at best, sorry, yawning, it's a uh, it's quite late. At best we'll end up with a binary that runs and then we see the system call handler being hit and then everything falls over in a heap. Not having a debugger is going to be exciting for this bit. But let's commit all this. I think that's everything. Let me just ch check. Uh, Lots of stuff. Nothing which looks. Oh, is this? Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. and we are probably done for the day. Uh, I was just building the utils directory which contains most of the executables but there's loads of other stuff in here including a port of a colossal cave that we can run on our embedded system and some ancient languages, I believe this is pilot, some stuff pulled from the Minix uh, application set, this is a VI clone, there's even some games, basic interpreter. All right, I am going to do something that doesn't involve coding for a while. Hope you enjoy this video, please let me know what you think in the comments.